Good evening, everyone. My name is Asit Lalji. On behalf of Avid Learning, I welcome you all this evening. The consequences of partition are not just limited to the physical displacement of millions of people or the political and economic ramifications that followed. Partition had a profound impact on our social, cultural, and emotional lives. It has affected the way we view ourselves, our community, and our relationship with others. The stories and memories of the 1947 partition are a crucial part of our social fabric and have shaped our cultures in a profound way. These stories play a critical role in helping us better understand our histories, our identities, and the complex factors that shape our societies. It is important that we continue to listen and learn from these stories of partition witnesses and ensure that these stories are preserved for future generations. Books and research documents can tell you more about the history of events that followed, but stories provide a more authentic understanding of the circumstances. After all, they capture the emotion of the trauma more vividly. Thanks to Dr. Gunita Bhalla, we have the invaluable 1947 partition archive today. Her team of volunteers and scholars have put in more than 30,000 hours of service so that generations and those after us will have access to those stories. The book, 10,000 Memories, A Lived History of Partition, is the outcome of more than a decade of hard work, conducted through the largest pan-South Asian oral history survey. At AVID, we strongly believe in collaboration and are proud to present this evening in partnership with the Mumbai Research Center and the Asiatic Society of Mumbai. And a special thank you to Shanaz and Mrs. Balaporia, who are here, I think. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome author, managing editor of the 1947 Partition Archive, Dr. Gunita Singh Bhalla, and deputy editor of Live History India, Aparna Andhare. During the presentation, Gunita will be sharing some oral narratives and histories from Bombay and beyond in her book, followed by a conversation with our wonderful moderator, Aparna. After the conversation, uh, in the presence of this esteemed audience, we'll unveil the book with some of the, the uh, people who have actually helped make it happen. So thank you, all of you, for being here in such large numbers. Uh, it's very kind on a Monday evening, that too. I, this, we're looking forward to this session, and I'm sure it's going to be an exciting one. Over to you, Gunita, and uh, please. Okay, hey, thank you so much for that introduction and for hosting this event today. Um, so thank you to the Asiatic Society and everybody who was involved in that. And thanks to each of you for making the journey here today to hear about this work. Um, and I'm honored. Uh, okay, so I think we're going to start with a video. What is history? Is it the story of leaders and of empires? Whose history is it? Who gets to tell it? And who gets to write it? We believe that each human plays a role in creating history. All of your ancestors have contributed. The story of our past is as nuanced and colorful as we are today. Back in 2009, when we began building the 1947 Partition Archive, the history of partition was almost forgotten. It was mostly told in numbers. 14 million people became refugees, the story would go. Many perished, many witnessed gruesome horror. Words cannot be found to describe them. But what do all these numbers mean, really? We decided to find out from those who lived through it. We built a platform where all of us could come together to document stories before they were lost to time. We began teaching oral history, workshops online, for free, twice a month. Thousands of you attended, thousands of you volunteered and donated. 
Over time, you helped record 10,000 voices, which will forever be preserved to create a new and more inclusive story of our past. This is your heritage. These are your stories. These are your roots. Welcome to the 1947 Partition Archive. <laughs> So it's my pleasure uh, to talk about the book here today. We've been working on this. This book is actually a reflection of about 13 years of field work by hundreds uh, of people who are supported by thousands of other people. Um, so the way that this book is set up is really a journey across the subcontinent through stories. So you get to travel across the subcontinent from east to west or west to east, however you choose, um, through lived experiences vicariously. And we've done something interesting here. So how many of you guys think that Punjab was the only place affected by partition? Of course, you, the way I asked that question, you already know the answer. But, but yeah, that's you know the common notion is, has been for a long time that it was just Punjab. Of course, Punjab was partitioned. Bengal, the province, was also partitioned, and um, a lot of the mayhem and violence occurred there. But it turns out that the entire subcontinent was impacted. And it also turns out that you know, when you put these stories together, um, you have to actually you get a more holistic picture. It's not, you can't look at partition by itself it turns out you have to really see it in the context of World War II. It's like a continuation of World War II and its impacts in South Asia. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that the stories uh, really bring about. So we can go to the next slide. Oh, so what we've done actually to capture that, which I'll talk more about in a second, or I'll show you guys an image in a second. Um, we don't have uh, and like a front or back cover of the book. Both sides of the book are the front cover. So it opens on the east on one end, and it opens on the west on the other end. So you would flip the book. Um, you know, you can look at it from either side. So you travel from Afghanistan to Myanmar, or the other way around, depending on how you want to look at it. And you meet in the middle at the Deccan Plateau. And there's a lot of places here where you think, you know, traditionally, oh, that wasn't impacted. Well, it turns out that when you go out and you actually talk to people on the ground, you, you find out that, yes, it was, that every place in the subcontinent was impacted. And for the last um, you know, many years, over a decade, uh, hundreds of us have been going out and documenting these stories. And some, each page in the book actually reflects an incredible amount of work, which could be days. Um, so before I get into the book, I just want to make a point, and I'm going to ask you guys a question. So does anyone know what's going on, say, in Srinagar right now? Or um, Shanghai? Or South Africa? And again, once again, you know, you're not answering my question, and that means that you already know the answer. Of course you don't. Um, you know, there's so much going on in the rest of the world in this very moment. It's so incredibly complex that no one person can know everything that's going on. And the same is true for history. For every moment before this moment is as complex as this moment now. Yet we have this tendency to reduce it down to like a sentence, right? Or down to a story because our human minds are limited and we should be aware of that. So we reduce you know, these huge, massive, complex histories into small stories that our brains can comprehend. And that too, within the context of our modern morality, our modern value system, and not just one morality or value system, but 
you know, the value system of your particular community where you grew up and your geography. And so what that means is that, you know, we're all prone to getting polarized and we're all prone to knowing, you know, very like sort of myopic and limited histories. And sometimes people can challenge that. They might say, oh, well, actually this happened and that could make you very, very angry. And what our book does is that it forces you to actually recognize the fact that history is extremely complex. And I mean, you know, we have new apps like ChatGPT, which could help you understand how limited a single human mind is, right? It makes it really, really clear. And so that's true for history as well. And uh, unfortunately, that does get in the way. If you know about a lot of social issues we're having today, they're all rooted in, you know, knowledge of history by different communities and how those that knowledge differs by community. And so I think one of the cool things about the book is that it does help you, it kind of challenges your views. And in fact, if you find yourself getting angry at some of the stories, it's a good thing. In fact, it might be a good point to stop and be like, oh, I'm getting challenged. Let me think about this. Like, why do I hold the particular views that I hold? And where did I get those views from? So it, it helps you question that. So next slide. Um, so yeah, like I said, every moment in our past is just as complex as this moment now. Okay, um, so the stories force us to confront this complex past. I just wanted to throw in this B-roll video here. Uh, so B-roll is when our team members go out and conduct interviews. They are also asked as an option to record some B-roll footage. And I guess you guys being in Mumbai, you probably know what that means. But basically they're also recording some of the surroundings so that we can contextualize the story of the person where they are. This particular B-roll um, is from an interview by Zubair Torvali, who's on the right in the black um, Salvar Kamis. And he's uh, traveled for a couple of days to this village in Swat in northwest Pakistan to meet somebody who had some really intriguing memories of that time period. Now what's really fascinating is, you know, we crowdsource, so we developed this whole protocol to crowdsource oral histories. And what that does is it empowers everybody or anybody, anyone here can do it too, if you just, you know, take our workshop or any workshop, I guess, um, to go out and record stories. And so when you create a platform that's open to anyone, you start to get stories from places scholars would never go to because we don't expect stories to be there traditionally. And so that's what this work has enabled. It's enabled um, people like Zubair to submit stories uh, from these places that have been traditionally, you know, not really seen as important to history. And in this particular case, they speak a language called Torvali. So everybody with that surname, um, Torvali, they speak a language called Torvali. It's only in this one valley and it's endangered. There's only 3,000 speakers. But that language is also sort of getting recorded in the archive. So next slide. So uh, one of the things, uh, there's actually a video there in the background. It may or may not play while we're here, but that's fine. Um, so I'll just make my point. So, you know, what our oral histories show us is that the traditional archive alone is no longer adequate because who makes the traditional archive? Quite often it's governments. And in the case of South Asia, uh, it's, you know, usually a colonial government. I mean, you had a lot of um, kingdoms and stuff, so they, some of those archives still survive, and that's different. Uh, but, you know, it's usually the colonial government, and what the colonial government thinks is important to put in an archive may not be completely reflective of reality, right? So that data set by itself is also incomplete and is also biased. And even though that bias may be frozen in time and it's not changing like human memory is, it is biased. Everything is actually biased, right? Because somebody is choosing what's important. Um, and so that's why having a diverse, you know, data set actually helps you get closer and closer to a more realistic picture. Another data set that's common um, traditionally is the newspaper archive. And newspapers are really fascinating because one of the things that we're finding is that newspapers from the 1940s are highly polarized. So they're usually aligned with particular ideologies. They're aligned with particular perspectives, pol particular political parties, or they're aligned with the colonial government. And so you start to see articles in these newspapers that are also aligned with you know, the bigger picture. So you need to look at a lot of different newspapers. You need to look at archives. And now we have this whole other data set of 
human exper lived experiences or memories of lived experiences, right? Which can be considered alongside the traditional archive. So next slide. And you know, that brings me to this point that history, um, this, it's all about history in the empowered digital age. It's gonna have to be different. So we are way more empowered today than we realize, especially with social media, because now everybody's viewpoint is important, which was not the case in the past. So suddenly, you know, now if somebody comes out with a history and you've got something in your family archives or your family oral history, you can go on Twitter and you can challenge it. You can say, oh, well, I've got this document from my grandparents who served, you know, did this and that. And it says something different. So you have that voice now, which, you know, our ancestors and people who came before us did not. And so history is now going to need to be changed because suddenly everybody matters. It's not just a select few you know, groups of people, and all narratives have now, now have to be included. And the coolest thing about it is that it's going to close the gap between folk history and official histories, which actually gives rise to a lot of social problems. Because when there's a gap between what the people, you know, the history that's in, within a certain group of people versus what they're told has actually happened, um, that creates a lot of distrust with authority, it creates rebellion and it, it can create a lot of, you know, social unrest. And we do see that actually still going on in South Asia. Um, so next slide. So yeah, so that brings me to the formation of our organization, the 1947 Partition Archive, which is putting out this book. And I just want to give you guys a very, very brief history. Um, so the, the original problem, you know, the concept of this kind of started in the 1990s when my grandmother told me about their partition experience and how millions of people were impacted, how they barely survived their migration from Lahore to Amritsar, um, and you know, why, how one time they were really well to do and how they were you know, uh, economically very badly impacted. And that stayed in my mind for a really long time. I had told my high school teacher, history teacher, because in our textbook it said that, you know, there was a peaceful movement led by Gandhi and uh, India gained freedom. There was, it was a bloodless sort of uh, transfer of power, but my grandmother was telling me something very, very different. And, and that really bothered me because my teacher said, well, maybe your grandmother doesn't really remember very well because it's not there in our textbook or maybe, what she, maybe she's exaggerating. But I knew she wasn't because I had heard stories from other people in the community. So that always really bothered me that that history was getting diminished because it wasn't being represented. Um, fast forward to July 2008, I was at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. They've done such an incredible job of preserving that memory from the survivors of the atomic bombing that it was sort of an aha moment. Like, oh yeah, of course, we need to um, record uh, these stories directly from the witnesses, from the survivors, because no one can tell it like them. Because when you know, somebody is speaking their truth, all forms of communication converge. You have their language, you have their body language, you have their facial expressions, their tone, everything is telling the same story. And, you know, that is believable. And, and, um, and it's very powerful. And it helps other people engage and empathize with that story. And so no one can tell it like the survivors. And, and it was like an aha moment in that, at that point. Um, I did a lot of research. I couldn't find anything much on partition, let alone even a Wikipedia page back then. Um, and there was definitely no archive or any sort of commemoration. There are very few books. Of course, uh, Krishman Singh's book I had read, Train to Pakistan, that was like the quintessential book back then on partition. And of course, Munto's writings and so on. Um, so the first, you know, uh, following the example of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, the first stories were actually recorded between December 2009, January 2010. Uh, I'm gonna go through this really fast. Uh, the concept of crowdsourcing, uh, what came from actually the UC Berkeley Department of Physics where I was a postdoc, they had crowdsourced, they had actually coined the term crowdsourcing. They had used um, this concept of spreading data on protein folding because they couldn't solve the protein folding problem. Very difficult science problem. Um, computers could not solve it, so they spread the data amongst lots of computers because the human brain actually can solve this problem, and they were able to crack that code and win the Nobel Prize. 
Um, and so I was very intrigued and inspired by that, and that's where the concept of crowdsourcing and applying it to oral history came from. And this building you see here, this is the Doe Library at UC Berkeley in the Bancroft Library. Um, so after my you know, lab work during the day, I, I myself and a mechanical engineer named Kedar and um, a journalism student named Group would go down into the underground stacks. On the right, there's a hill. So underneath that hill, there's these stacks that like nobody ever visits, or very rarely, so you can be as loud as you want in there. So we'd go down there until like 3 a.m. and kind of work out the mechanics of this crowdsourcing protocol. And over many months, um, that's how we did it. And then we did some test runs. Uh, we spent time in India and Bangladesh at the time, and a bunch of us. Um, we tested out how this could work. We worked with the UC Berkeley Regional Oral History Office. So a lot of work went into it and the crowdsourcing uh, protocol was born. And it really took off after New York Times did a cover story on it in August 2013. Uh, it was syndicated in many papers in India and that's when a lot of people sort of came on board and started uh, working with us in documenting these stories. Um, so next slide. So since then, it's been a Herculean effort to document the greatest migration of the last century we say that to be safe. It could, in fact, be one of the greatest migrations of all time. We don't know that for sure, uh, but we definitely know that it was the greatest migration of the last century, forced migration, so displacement. Next slide. Um, so just to give you some numbers, um, so hopefully you won't zone out during this time. So 11,000 stories are now preserved, almost, in the Partition Archive, making it you know, the biggest archive of oral histories in South Asia. Indian subcontinent, um, but also one of the biggest globally, and it's gonna keep growing. 36 languages are represented in the archive, um, 750 cities and villages, and uh, more than 70,000 antique photos and digitized um, images of artifacts. And next slide. So these are the two covers, the east and the west cover. Um, so you can see the book over there. In fact, uh, the final cover has gold foil, which you cannot see in this version. Um, next slide. I just wanted to give you some more numbers to bore you guys. Um, so if you need you know, a break to take a nap, now is a good time. So um, we started out with a thousand stories because people, I get asked this question all the time. So I was like, let me just put it in here. Uh, the book has about 400 stories in it. We started out with a thousand. There's 40 people who worked on this book together. And the way we narrowed them down was basically by looking at the people who were the oldest in the archive, people who were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s at the time of partition, so they could give us adult, um, you know, time, adult uh, age memories. And uh, we also looked at um, the geographical diversity. So we wanted to get you know, as diverse geographically a data set as possible in the book so we can get representation. Of course, we also looked at um, caste, class, religion, and gender in trying to get a balance. So this book is a tiny scratch in the surface, but it's still huge. It's like uh, 500 pages and, you know, lots of text and lots of photos too. Um, and six artists have been responsible for the artwork that you're gonna see in the book. Next slide. Um, what I'm going to do now briefly is just give you guys some glimpses. And these glimpses are very small. They're a scratch in the scratch in the surface. So, like I said, the book is a scratch in the surface, and these are even smaller. So I'm just giving you guys some quotes from the book to give you guys an idea of some of the fascinating um, insights that we get into the past. Um, these quotes are by no means representative of the entire book or even of this entire story because some of these stories are like 10 hours of video recording, um, but this is just a glimpse. So, you know, if you start from the east side um, of the book, you will start during World War II. You'll start with the Japanese bombing of Burma, which was huge for triggering the uh, freedom movement, you know, the Quit India movement and so on within India, because it was the first time that uh, somebody had found the Achilles heel of this giant, you know, British empire that was supposed to be all powerful and no one could touch it. And, uh, and the Japanese were advancing very, very fast, which 
is what enabled a lot of these freedom movements to gain a lot of traction. Um, so here's somebody who grew up in Burma. So another interesting thing that we learn as we look through these stories is that um, in Burma, you had settlements of people from a lot of the big cities in British India. So that would be Lahore, uh, Peshawar, uh, Madras, I'm using the old names, um, Kolkata, Mumbai, Bombay, and the locals considered everybody, all of these people, to be occupiers. Um, and so, in fact, you know, you guys probably have heard of the forward block movement started by Subhash Chandra Bose. Well, there was a similar movement fashioned on the forward block called the Freedom Block in uh, Burma. And so what happened is they collaborated with the Chinese, uh, sorry, with the Japanese, and they actually uh, came in and they started, uh, there was a forced migration. There was a land grab after the Japanese invasion. They wanted their land back. And there was a forced migration of half a million people from the Indian subcontinent along with um, British personnel. And that was, I think, a huge foreshadowing of what was going to happen during partition, which was also what we're finding from the oral histories, a massive land grab, essentially. Um, so I'm going to read just some quotes. I completed my schooling until fifth grade in Burma, and it was very cosmopolitan, as I was studying alongside students from Bengal, Burma, and Madras. And then, you know, there's the rest of his story, and then you get another quote from his adult life. In 1947, from Ambala, my aircraft protected the convoys crossing the border by surveying the lands ahead for ambushes. So this is fascinating. The Air Force, so he was in the Air Force, the British Air Force, um, they were trying to protect, you know, all these refugees as best as they could because their manpower was very, very small, uh, you know, in that post-World War II environment. Um, and then he talks about, in 1948, their plane gets diverted to Kashmir. But what's really fascinating is you have stories from Punjab where they actually talk about these planes as people are getting attacked, how these planes start to dive down and the attackers get scared and kind of run away. So you get that confirmation as well. So next story. Just another quote uh, from the 1940s in Myanmar. The British soldiers who were leading our group would wake everyone early in the morning and the rest of the day was spent walking through the wilderness. Some of the adults traveled on elephants. So we don't even know how many people died. Like, you know, the estimate is that about half a million people migrated. It could be much, much more. We have no idea. Um, next slide. And then here's something interesting, like, you know, we don't, I actually did not know the level of involvement of the Americans um, in World War II in, in British India. Um, so here we've, we've got a lot of memories actually, especially from Bengal and Assam and uh, Northeastern India of um, a lot of the American soldiers and the interactions that happened with them. So during World War II, a squadron of five North American P-51 Mustang aircrafts with sharks painted on their noses landed in a nearby field. One of the Americans there said, say you kids wanna come on and see them planes? We agreed immediately. So I love that quote because it made us go back and search for these, you know, what were this like these shark painted noses on aircraft? And there was a fascinating history that unfolded there. So if you go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so this is what they look like. And uh, there was this really interesting operation that the Americans were doing. So the Americans, you know, were trade partners with the, Jap uh, with the, with the Chinese. And Japan, as you know, during the 19, late 1930s and 40s had taken over a huge part of Northwestern China. And so the Americans were trying to help the Chinese and um, they were providing them with fuel. And where were all the oil wells? They were in northeastern India, Assam. The biggest oil wells in the world were actually in Assam and Burma, not in the Middle East at that time. And so they were taking the oil from there and flying it in operation over the hump into China. But the problem was that aircrafts back then could not actually go over the Himalayas, so they had to go through the Himalayas, and it was very dangerous. They lost 60% of their planes. And to this day, there's a what they call an aluminum trail in that part of the Himalayas where you can still see um, you know, the remains of these aircrafts uh, because there were so many hundreds that went down. Okay, next slide. Uh, another quote from World War II. During World War II, I witnessed the freedom 
Uh, sorry, the fighter plane zooming past from the rooftop. African soldiers marched on the road. One morning when a bomb was dropped on Hathi Bagan Bazaar, which was adjacent to our house, splinters hit our home. Our house began shaking and the roof collapsed. So African soldiers, and it turns out there were one lakh African soldiers, mainly primarily from West Africa, also serving in Bengal and Northeastern India. Um, next slide. And these are just some images. Um, you know, on the right, you have the uh, African uh, soldiers. On the left, you have the American soldiers signing some autographs or something for children in uh, uh, Kolkata. And next slide. Uh, this was so fascinating, too, for me, because I did not know about the German and Italian internment camps, which are very similar to the Japanese internment camps the Americans had um, at the same time. So there was probably some intellectual collaboration going on there between the Americans and the British. So people of uh, German, you know, German citizens who had run away from Nazi Germany, mostly German Jews who had come, um, you know, into hiding into India, British India, uh, they were gathered during World War II and put into internment camps. And same with people of Italian descent. We've heard from shepherds in, um, you know, the Spithi area, whose stories have been recorded, and Himachal, who talk about these Italian camps. And you don't find that much open source information about these camps. There's still no Wikipedia page, or maybe that's going to change. Maybe somebody will read this in the book and, you know, put up a Wikipedia page about it. But, but yes, yeah, so another fascinating history. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but maybe I'll go through one or two more. Um, freedom movements, revolutionary movements uh, that were going on, you know, back in the 20s and 30s that have been forgotten today. You start to hear about them in these oral histories. And you start to hear about the collaboration between the Irish freedom movements and the Indian freedom movements and how they were using San Francisco, the Gather Party, as a port. So they would send their material from Ireland to San Francisco and it would come into you know, India, either through the Bay of Bengal or through Bombay, and the same, it was, you know, material was going back from here. So absolutely fascinating that you know, these freedom movements were actually global. Um, and I, I guess we're probably out of time, but I'll do one more story for you. We've all heard stories about you know, the abductions of women. Uh, we know that there were almost one lakh women that were abducted that at least we know of officially. Um, but you also had women, I wanted to highlight this story because you have all these really interesting stories of how a lot of women protected themselves. So she talks about how women who were, you know, young and beautiful were being kidnapped. And so she covered herself in mud and filth to protect herself so that she wouldn't kidnap, she would look, uh, you know, unattractive and nobody would want to kidnap her. So that was her strategy and it worked. Um, next slide. We hear of these unbelievable stories, and sometimes, you know, these stories can make you question oral history, and I kind of wanted to talk about how you create legitimacy with memory. So in this case, this particular gentleman who was um, interviewed in Batala in Punjab, um, he was an adult, he was in his 20s in 1947, and he talks about how his village was being attacked, but these women um, who were dressed you know, very elaborately, but they also had a lot of ammunition strapped to them, um, came on horseback, and um, I guess they bombed the mobs, and they protected their village and took everybody to safety in a caravan. And it sounded kind of wild, like, okay, are women from that time period actually going to do that? Obviously, they were trained, you know, they knew what they were doing. Uh, but then, you know, months later, we heard another story from all the way in California from somebody from the same district, District Narawal, where he was migrating from, who also talks about these women on horseback that protected them. And for her, the sight was so unbelievable that she says, oh, actually it was Guru Gobind Singh and he came in the roop of these three women on horseback to protect us. So, you know, those type of fascinating things happen. And next, next slide. We also see a generational gap in perspective um, and in opinion, we start to see that um, you know, a lot of people who were in their maybe 40s and 50s at that time in the 1940s were not necessarily keen on being revolutionaries and, you know, gaining freedom. They were like, fine. They were like, okay, we're settled. Everything is, you, you don't see that, like, josh of freedom as much as you do in the younger generations. And you see a lot of people that we've interviewed complain about their parents 
being okay with British Raj, which is really fascinating. And so, you know, this quote just captures some of that spirit at the time. We were eager to join a revolution to fight. One day we charged at a police station. I'm not sure exactly why we did it, but everybody was doing it. The in thing was that the British must go. So <laughs> I thought it was cute too. So next slide. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, because I don't want to, like, get into a debate in the audience or anything. But uh, what I find really fascinating is that different regions have very different allegiances and viewpoints um, to leaders, well-known leaders of that time period. A lot of kingdoms, people had allegiances to their royal families and were not interested in being a part of, you know, kind of the bigger India or Pakistan or whatever the new states were going to come about. And, and within uh, British India, you, had, you were split amongst loyalties of you know, some of the many leaders between Mahatma Gandhi, between Nehru, between Jinnah. Uh, and in some places like Punjab, you had like the Unionist Party, right? And so people had allegiance to none of these famous leaders of that time period. So that's also a really fascinating history that comes out from that time period. So next slide. So what we need is a new story of the past. Uh, we need to relook at the past uh, with a more objective lens. We need to question our own emotions when they arise because they do get in the way of understanding history more objectively. Uh, we need to go at it with a curiosity, with a self-awareness, with an openness, with being open to being challenged. And um, I think we need a new mindset for that. And I believe there should be one more slide. Okay, and I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, partition witnesses. There's many of you here who have taken the time um, to you know, spend with our volunteers and uh, to have your story recorded. I know it's a huge effort. It's an effort for the entire family. So our, our donors who actually make this work possible without donors, it would not be possible. Uh, volunteers who give up their time to do this, it's really a labor of love because uh, I would say like 95% of our team right now is still volunteer based. Um, the book co-producers, these are individuals who have donated and I think there's at least one person maybe, if he's here in this room, um, to make this book possible because without that we would not have been able to pay the artists and uh, you know, the other people who needed to be paid. And the Good Samaritans who, uh, whose name is not in our volunteer list. Uh, but they have, you know, gone out of their way to make every story possible. To so every story, it takes, you know, an army of people to make each interview possible. So every page in this book is actually like this huge epic journey in the back end that went into making that story possible. Um, there might be one more page. Okay. Oh, yeah. So these are just images of um, cover art. It was commissioned by the Bora sisters. And each chapter, the book is split into seven chapters from different regions. And each chapter has its own cover art that um, reflects artwork from that time period. And why I'm showing you these is because we have some of these um, limited edition prints printed on some nice paper for you guys today. And if you guys want to order books at 25% off, I'm, I do apologize, we're running behind on printing. We don't have the books with us here for you today, uh, which was the original plan that you could have taken books home with you today. Uh, but we are offering 25% off. And because uh, we're sad that we don't have books for you, if you do end up uh, pre-ordering a book, uh, we will be giving out these prints as a thank you gift. And that's about it from my end. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Gunita. Um, do come, do sit down, thanks. Thank you, everyone. I could have listened to these stories for a long, long time. Um, so first up, congratulations. Um, it's, it's a mammoth project. I think so far, every time we've thought about the partition, it's either been through a lens that separates narratives, so cinema for one, or um, a story like Tobatik Singh which helps us deal with the unspeakable. We've only been able to um, think about the partition now. We've always met with silence. We've always known that it, it happened. We've seen films, we've, we've read books, but it's 
it's when it becomes personal when it stops becoming a political event and when it becomes personal in the public domain that makes all the difference so congratulations for putting this together and thank you very much um, there are um, archives that are being built there's a museum being built there are books that are finally being written and when we are going all over celebrating 75 years of independence you can't celebrate without taking a pause to reflect on one of the bloodiest events that mankind has ever seen um, and so bloody that we've not been able to address it adequately enough um, I have a few questions for you and I I sort of don't know where to begin simply because how do we start addressing this so I'll begin with a, a technical question it's an archive that has been created how does one access this archive beyond the book yeah so we're working on creating responsible access so creating responsible access is actually kind of the biggest issue because uh, you don't want to endanger anyone's life a lot of people are talking about uh, murders that they have committed so they're brave enough now to talk about them a lot of people are saying things that could trigger you know people in the public to do things and so putting it out there is a huge responsibility uh, what, and it's also expensive by the way um, so what we're doing is a first step is we've got this book and every story in this book so all 400 of them are going to be uh, put out on YouTube only if we have the permission from the person whose story we've recorded if they've given us the permission, it's going to be put out on YouTube, and it's also going to be put on the Stanford University Library's digital repository. You can see, you'll be able to see the complete raw files over there. YouTube, of course, you're gonna have a slightly edited version because YouTube is you know, a public uh, platform, so we need to make it look good, we need to color correct it, and uh, kind of put all the files together. Um, so that's how we're going to start releasing the stories. I also wanted to mention, which I forgot, this is the first in a series of books, so all um, 10,000 of the 11,000 now stories are going to be in this series. I'm very glad to know that we're thinking about responsibly putting these together. What I'm quite taken by when we're looking at this is the sheer range of people um, that are involved you've got legitimate royalty talking about what they've been through and you've got really humble people um, people from you know several backgrounds how does one address this kind of disparity and yet come out with a narrative that doesn't um, glorify that is, doesn't essentialize um, experiences and and lends gravitas to to both ends so how did you address this uh, the disparity in the narratives that you were seeing yeah, thanks for that question. Actually, we, um, we basically kept the process exactly the same for everyone. So, and then um, for people who come from disempowered communities where people, you know, in, uh, like for example, crowdsourcing works really well in the cities, right? In urban areas uh, where people have access to technology, not only do they have access, but they have the culture of wanting to do something like this. Whereas in a lot of um, rural areas that are economically depressed, they may not, not only do they not have access, but they may not have the culture if they have the access. And so we've created the scholarship program where people get scholarships to actually go out and do that work. So we've put effort into trying to um, reach communities that are not traditionally represented. So that's kind of what we've done from our end. It's incredible. It's really interesting that you have people who are going out and collecting these um, narratives and who are, when, I'd like to talk about the, the issue of language. For one, when these stories are being, so, and this is a twofold question. The first is, what role does language play in accessing these narratives? Um, how does language interact with trauma? What does it hide? What does it reveal? And what does it resolve? And then what happens to language when it gets translated into English? Because the whole book is in English. So um, what happens to language then? Um, in terms of language, language absolutely matters. Um, if, when somebody is telling their story in their mother tongue, it's going to be more powerful, right? They're going to be able to speak their truth better. Um, and when we do translate it in, into English, absolutely, we're going to lose some of that information, some of that power. 
But now it's about accessibility, like you know, Thorvali, the language I was telling you guys about earlier. There's only 3,000 speakers. How will the rest of you know? How will the rest of us know that story if you don't translate it? So it, it's a little bit of a give and take. So in order to know that story, we're going to know a little bit lesser of that story than what they've actually told us, maybe even a little bit skewed because the translator may misunderstand something. You will have a loss in translation. It, the loss in translation um, is, it's a dual loss because then you're bringing it into English. I suppose it's, it's going to be from a regional language into this and then it gets edited, doesn't it? So there are things that we will leave in. Um, speaking of, of, of narratives, is there a difference between the way men tell their stories and the way women tell their stories? Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to quickly say something about um, the loss, you know, with the book. Uh, we are, that's why we're going to put out the full story, so that you guys can see the original. And yes, this is going to be curated, shortened into one page. Um, now, in terms of men and women, there's definitely uh, a difference. Uh, so, in terms of the male and female storytelling, one of the things that we have found, and many of our team members, we've actually reflected on this together as a team, that a lot of um, women actually talked about it more. So by the time we came around to record their story, like 60, 70 years later, they were not as traumatized. And they even, you know, the really traumatic events, they were able to recall them very matter-of-factly and very fluidly and openly. But for a lot of uh, men who went through trauma, this is not true for everyone. I don't want to generalize too much, but just an observation that we've made and reflected on as a team is that they had not necessarily always talked about their trauma. And so when we come around to record it, sometimes it can take several times. And it's like this huge retelling of the trauma, but we've worked with psychologists quite a bit to figure out how to do, how to engage them in a way that's therapeutic rather than you know, going to leave them stuck in their trauma again. And so we have noticed that one difference. And there's a few others, but I'll mention that for now. So basically what I was saying is one of the differences, there's actually many differences we've noticed uh, that can't fully be generalized, but you definitely have a good percentage on either side of the male-female divide where this experience lives. So I'm going to uh, kind of make a little generalization right now. Basically, uh, one of the things we notice is that a lot of women who've experienced trauma at the time of partition, they have talked about it so much in the last, you know, 60, 70 years. So by the time we come around, they can recall it very fluidly without much emotion and very matter-of-factly. Uh, whereas a lot of men who've experienced trauma did not socialize about it, maybe withheld talking about it. And when we come around, there's a lot of, um, it, it becomes very difficult and it's a reliving of that trauma and it can take several tries for us to talk about it with them. That's one of many differences we've noticed uh, between male and female uh, testimonies of trauma. May I ask you about your process? Because when you're listening to these stories, this can't be a pleasant experience either. So as someone who is sort of listening to them over and reading them over and over again, how did you deal with all the stories? What were the kind of stories? Um, I'm inclined to believe that they're not all going to be dark. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how did you, as a scholar and as a person, and as someone who's had um, a personal experience and a connection with this, how did you deal with receiving these stories and your process of working through them? Yeah, that's a great question too. So um, in terms of trauma, so because we record the entire life story and their entire life was not traumatic, we will be going you know, with them throughout the emotional experience. So that traumatic part happens at the time of partition, but there's something really interesting to remember. The people we're interviewing are survivors. They survived the trauma. And so we go through the trauma with them, and then we all, as listeners, also, because we empathize, we survive with them. So by the end of the interview, you're nobody, neither party is left in a traumatic state because you've actually gone through the trauma and come out on the other side as they tell the rest of the story. This is something we learned actually by consulting psychologists to do it that way. So that's why we've designed it that way. And in terms of how we deal with it personally, 
Uh, yeah, when making this book, for example, uh, I mean, I showed you guys uh, Iqbal Bibi's story who migrated from Hashiarpur to Lahore. Uh, there's actually some uh, way more traumatic stuff that I did not put up here on screen for you guys. And that particular story kind of traumatized a few of us. Like, I literally couldn't sleep for a couple of nights, you know? And, um, and the way I look at it is that if, if my ancestors, and I consider everybody my ancestors, uh, if they went through it, if they had to go through it, it's, you know, the least I could do is be traumatized just in my mind for a couple of days. Um, that's the least that I could do for them, to, is to listen to that. You know, because sometimes people do say, oh, well, uh, maybe, you know, maybe you guys should not be doing this because it's so traumatic. But actually, it's healing. It's healing for everyone. And we also need to know what happened um, to our ancestors and why they are who they are and why we are who we are. So that's kind of one way. But, you know, the stories are not all dark because while making this book, there were times when we were actually laughing very hard because some of the stories are very humorous and there's a lot. There's a whole range of emotions. I don't know how the reader is going to feel, but I know making the book was amazing. It was a very emotional experience all around. Thank you. Um, because we're on the topic of process, what was it like? How did you, because it's such a visual book. So a part of me wants to think about this also as a visual archive, um, digging into photographs, into archival footage, um, bringing it from several places. So what was it like? What was the process like to create a visual archive alongside an oral archive? And the, um, and the B-roll footage that goes with it is incredibly interesting, also because it has the interview in it. Um, so you see it's not a nameless, faceless person, but it's, it's someone that you can then um, recognize. So what was that process like? And how did you arrive on that particular format? Um, that's thanks to the digital age that we live in. Uh, and I would have to say, again, that's an inspiration that came from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Archives, because what I found really powerful there was that, you know, before going to the Peace Memorial, I had, in high school, I had read books on, you know, Black Rain. I had watched movies about Hiroshima. But when I heard it from the survivors, it was incredibly powerful. And why? I realized, I was like, why was that powerful? It was because of the multiple forms of communication, their body language, tone, facial expression. And so that why it was, that's the reason that we've um, kind of gravitated towards ensuring the visual element was there as well. Um, and uh, it contextualizes their experience, I think, when you see their environment. And because we're in Bombay, I have to ask you this. Um, when you put an archive like this together, um, films, literature, pop culture must have an impact, at least on, or does it have an impact um, on the way these stories are told, on what people remember? Um, and if you could tell us a couple of Bombay stories. Actually, I think there are people here in the audience who would be able to tell you Bombay stories better than myself. Um, but in terms of how uh, the stories kind of change, in fact, I just wrote a paper on this, how Creating the archive then changes the public, which in turn, having changed, changed the archive. So it's like this circular process because it is a collaborative archive, you know, with the public. Uh, but yeah, I would have to say that, you know, when we first started this work, uh, you know, we had to be very stubborn about it because the feedback left and right was like, why do you want to record stories of partition? Who cares about partition? It was so long ago. But after, you know, like our Facebook page, I think, hit around a million followers in 2016 when Facebook changed its algorithm and we were no longer organic, blah, blah. Now it's gone down. But anyway, the point was uh, that at that time, there were about 20 million hits on the stories per year. And that just shows you that the stories are starting to spread, right? And they're impacting people, even if they don't realize it. They may see it in passing and not realize it happened to them. And so we start to see a shift. We start to see that before we used to convince people and it became the other way around. People were like, oh, I have a story and I want to tell it. And then more, and people who had denied, um, you know, wanting to share their stories previously were like, well, I want to tell it too, because I remember what this person said, you know, what this person I saw on your page said, because I remember it better, or I remember something similar. And so it changed, it became, it normalized this whole concept of accepting that this happened and that people should talk about it. I think people were not given importance earlier, and we caught a lot of that when we were doing this work initially. 
And then we saw that shift while doing this work, like this big public shift that happened. Um, okay, like I'm trying to think, there, there are, we have stories of the mutiny that happened in Bombay in 1945-46. We have stories um, of, we have a story of an Anglo-Indian gentleman that I can think of right at the top of my head uh, from the time of the mutiny. And uh, he then, you know, he meets Gandhiji. He meets um, a number of people, but I think that particular story, you'll have to go into the book. I don't remember details. I just remember that he talks about the mutiny. But we have, an, actually, something else really interesting comes to mind um, from Bombay and Pune, specifically. So when uh, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated, we hear a lot of stories from across the subcontinent, from people from different communities, from Sikhs, uh, from Muslims, uh, from Parsis, people who are worried that, oh my gosh, I hope the assassin is not from my community or my religious group because I'm going to get targeted. And so people are hunkering down in their homes, uh, thinking that they're going to get targeted. Then it's announced, you know, the, that the community of the assassin, Godse, is announced. And I think he's from a Maharashtran Brahmin community. And, um, you know, I didn't know about this before, but we hear stories from Bombay and Pune that community was targeted, and their houses were burnt down. Um, and I had not known that before until I heard stories from Bombay and Pune about this. But I think there's going to be stories in the audience of actual lived experience from Bombay, so I don't want to um, you know, give you guys a secondhand story in the spirit of our work. <laughs> um, when, you, when, when you're looking at these stories, is there um, archival, re is there research that happens um, from um, sources that are beyond oral narratives, like other libraries you go to. So if someone here is interested and wants to trace a certain journey, where, where should they look? Um, you know, the British libraries, there's a number of them, actually have incredible amounts of information and data that like, has been sitting there because no one's taken interest. Uh, because we've been reaching out to them. We've got um, a lot of uh, archival photos in this book to contextualize some of the stories from you know, the National Army Museum, from the British Library, from the Scottish Museum, and so on. And when we speak to them, they're more than happy to share these images because no one has looked at them in a really long time. So I think as uh, our interest in history grows, uh, more and more uh, people from the Indian subcontinent are going to start accessing these archives because that's where you know, our history is. And, there, there are, um, you know, inaccessible parts of our own archives. Uh, a lot of um, stuff in the government archives in India is not yet accessible. So maybe people will make a push for that as well. Once we're open-minded enough to receive that difficult history, I think. I have two questions from what you were saying earlier. One is, um, you know, you, you gave a caveat before you asked this, but about um, historical figures and how they're perceived. Can you tell me the nature of difference uh, when you say that, that historical figures are, or polemical figures are perceived differently in different places? What, what do you mean by that? What's that nature of difference? Okay, well, I don't want to offend anyone, so I'm just going to put that out there. I'm going to just tell you what I've seen in the oral histories. Um, let's take Mahatma Gandhi, for example. Uh, what I was absolutely fascinated by is the massive following he has in some parts. Like if you go to um, Sindh, Gujarat, uh, if you go to the northeastern parts of India, parts of Bengal and Assam, if you go to the south, some parts of the south, not all. But then if you go to Punjab, you don't get the same. You had other local leaders that were way more popular. Um, you go to the north central part of India, you know, you go to uh, UP and Bihar, you see that, uh, you know, Jinnah and Nehru have more popularity in those areas. Um, so that's the type of difference that we're seeing. And it's really fascinating because it kind of, um, you see that these leaders were not like the monoliths that we kind of learn about today, that it was not this like even picture that we learn about today, that you actually have a tapestry of how they're perceived across the subcontinent. Thank you. That's really fascinating. It also sort of brings us to realize that there's a 
collective history that goes and that nuance is something that we really need. So when biographies happen, when biographies come from different languages, from different regions, it lends us, um, gives us a, an insight. The other thing that fascinated me when you were um, presenting and that I wanted to ask you about was you said that when you speak to people who are at different age points, there's a difference in narrative. So can you give us a bit, can you tell us a little bit more about that? about, um, and so, you know, what do people remember when they're at, at a different age point? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, people who are of a younger age, who are, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, um, their memories now will also get shaped by what they heard from their parents. And it's not always 100% direct experience. Um, whereas people who lived through it as adults, of course, that memory also over time, it's been processed. Uh, if it's been processed, is going to change. Uh, but I, you do get more uh, vivid detail from the adults. Um, from children, you do too, but it, it's a very different perspective. Like, for example, um, some people we've interviewed who are five, six years old, they will say, oh, but, you know, I was really sad because we had to leave my ball behind, and I was sad about that for years, that I left my purple ball behind. And it stays with them for a really, really long time. Um, and then, you know, I remember uh, one story where she was three years old, but she really wanted to be interviewed because of this one haunting memory. Even though she was three, she remembers someone being struck by a bullet and falling right in front of her. And she, as a three-year-old child, still to this day was very haunted by that particular memory. So, you know, those are the types of things. They may not remember the political movements, the conversations, but they'll remember those types of things, which I think is really important too, to capture. Absolutely. Um, Myra Kalman, who is an illustrator um, in America, has a set of 10 suitcases that she has left in her living room that belong to this person who was fleeing uh, Denzing in um, 1939. And for her, it's a memorial to the Holocaust and everything that's lost. Like the purple ball, what is a material reminder, what is a material memory keeper for what you've seen or what, you know, what has been lived through and what are the materials that keep this past alive? So I think, um, so that's really interesting. Um, I would say that of the people we've interviewed, very few, a very small percentage actually were able to bring anything over. Um, because partition was such a property grab, such an opportunity to loot, is what we're finding from the stories. Even people that we've interviewed who've, um, you know, committed the violence, they talk about their motivation being loot. That was like a, a big motivation for a lot of people, it appears. Um, and so because of that, a lot of people were not able to bring much over because it was looted if they tried to bring anything over. But that said, some of the interesting things that have come across, especially actually a story from uh, Bombay, somebody was able to bring their jula. Like in Sindh, these julas were very prominent in every household. And um, somebody was actually able to bring that over as the sole thing that they brought over because it meant so much to their family. They were able to get it um, dis dismantled. It was specially made. And then um, bring it here, I think, on camelback or horseback. I don't remember that detail. That story is in the book as well. Um, so that's one memory. Uh, but there's people like my own grandfather. Um, he tried to bring, I think, like 27 truckloads of things, um, but all his trucks were seized and he was only allowed to bring one Guru Granth Sahib and it turns out it was one of the original, you know, 40 or so that were handwritten. So it was a very special um, thing that even the mobsters recognized how important it was and let him bring it. Uh, but so there are, you know, a few things uh, that people talk about that they bring or a piece of jewelry that they may have brought or like a spoon even that they may have brought as like a Nishani type thing. So we do have that. That's quite evocative, the fact that, that someone recognized how important this, this object, the book, is because it's, it is a sacred object, right? And the idea of sacred and the ideas of objects sort of shift constantly. When you talk to people who've committed what is definitely not, you know, they're not being nice and, and, or looted, um, how do they process what they have done? Are, is there a sense of remorse? Is there a sense, what, what, what's the journey for that person who's admitting to something like this? Because um, you're recording the whole, the whole story. So how do they 
um, how do they react to what they've done? Um, I think this is really fascinating. Um, so we see a mixture. We see people who are very sorry and who want to. We've been approached by people who want to tell their story because they're, it's like um, a form of cleansing for them. You know, like they want to talk about what they did because it was wrong. They were really young. They were sometimes as young as eight and 10 years old when they were going around doing this looting. And uh, we have people who talk about how their mothers made them give everything back, you know, when they came home with all this loot. Um, then you have people who were very proud of it and they've processed it as something that they did the right thing. Um, there was one gentleman who talked about murdering a lot of elderly that were left behind. A lot of people abandoned the elderly. I mean, I cannot fathom, you know, you've lived your whole life building something for your family and then you're abandoned in a moment like this. I guess they couldn't help it. They were, everybody was running and um, they were left behind. And so, I mean, I'm sorry for this very dark story, but this gentleman actually went and he uh, murdered a lot of the people left behind. And he said he was doing the right thing because who was going to take care? They were going to, going to starve to death if he had not done what he did. So you have those types of stories. But then we hear something really interesting. So I've heard in so many stories, especially from Punjab, where the violence was like absolutely wild. Um, a lot of people talk about, oh yeah, my neighbor or you know, my cousin or this person, that person, they did all these killings and you know, they died really young from all this disease. So it, it seemed like the killings caused a lot of mental illness in the people who committed these crimes, who were in that moment made to think that it was the right thing to do by whatever uh, you know, inspirational leaders or whoever it was. And so there was a lot of psychological trauma amongst the people who did these killings. And it was, you know, thousands of people who did this, so. And what was the process like for you um, and your editors to then edit these, because these are not going to be one-line narratives, right? They're, they're very complex. You don't know what to leave out. You don't know what to, what to what, you know, what stays. And I mean, we could have tombs and tombs of, you know, of, of, of stories, but you are then bound to this, this format. So how do you decide? Yeah, so um, that's a great question again. Um, how we decided, we wanted it to be, it, it's always, always gonna be biased, right? So whenever you have one human, it's gonna be biased too. So what we wanted it to be was a diversity of bias. <laughs> so you get a lot of different biases, right? Uh, so there's 40 of us who worked on this book. Um, we first you know, chose the, thousand oldest people in the in our archive um, then we went in and chose for geographical diversity um, and then we went in and chose for gender diversity caste and class diversity and religious diversity so we tried to stick to these elements without reading their stories which all of these elements appear in our metadata so you don't actually have to go in and read the story um, so that we could get uh, it's not unbiased, it's always biased, right? This is our bias, I'm giving you guys our bias. So we can get some, like a data set that's not biased by what we read in the stories. Because, well, and also I wanna say that every story is gonna come out in book format. Um, it's gonna be, a, you know, a whole shelf full of books. So if somebody's in here and their story's missing in the book and you've recorded your story with the archive, know that it's gonna be out in one of the books. Are you still collecting these stories? And what does one do to, if, if you know, if someone wants to now um, send you a story, how do they do that? Um, you can sign up on our website. Uh, if you go to 1947partitionarchive.org, um, you can sign up to share your story. Um, in fact, maybe we can even put out a piece of paper if we have any. Uh, you guys, you can sign up. Uh, you can put your email down and phone number and we can give you guys a call. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And if you want to record, you want to learn to record an oral history interview, we do every two weeks. We've been doing this since 2012, so 11 years. Every two weeks, we do a free oral history workshop online. People join from all over the world. I think we've trained 17,000 people so far. Um, so you can go in, learn the art of oral history. It's a very enriching experience. I highly recommend it. So if you have stories in your family, I recommend that you take this free workshop. Whether you turn it into the archive or not is up to you, but the workshop is there, and it's, it's just a really cool way of um, you know, connecting 
with your family history. On a lighter note, every time we've done Avid events online, and I know we're running out of time, Asad sort of pops up on my computer screen. Um, I really miss that feature here. So, so I'm going to ask you one last question, and that gives you enough time, Asad, to, to gather your thoughts um, for us to wrap up. When you're collecting these stories, um, we're, we're, you know, all these experiences, there are bound to be things that get left behind. There are bound to be things that do not get recorded, that will never make it to the archive. What are those things? I think um, there are a lot of things that people may not want their next generations to know. That's one thing. Um, I'll give you an example. So I have personally met many women in Punjabi villages who were kidnapped and changed their religion. And 99% of them do not want to talk about it because they don't want their next generations. They don't want their grandkids to know. And even if their grandkids know, the grandkids don't want the surrounding people in their communities to know because they will be shunned. And in you know, a rural, close-knit community, you can't afford to be shunned. So those types of things. Um, yeah, and maybe acts of violence. I have had people you know, who, after the camera is shut off and I'm walking away, they're like, oh, yeah, I did, you know, murder a couple of people and I had to do it because of X, Y, Z reason. Well, do you want to, do you want me to turn the camera back on? No, no, I don't want to talk about it on camera. So yeah, so things do get left out. Thank you. Um, Asad? Thank you so much, Gunita, for such a interesting presentation and your journey and this archive. I think you've got to come back and do an oral history archive workshop for AVID. So I think we'll start with that and then we'll all start rec recording our family histories. Uh, we all need it. But thank you so much. Thank you, Aparna, for so skillfully moderating as usual. Um, you know, um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we We'll thank all our partners, the, the Mumbai Research Center and Asiatic, Asiatic Society of Mumbai, um, Shanaz and uh, Mrs. Balapori. They've always been so generous and welcoming. In fact, they're so welcoming, we're going to be back here uh, on the 28th of March with a, a wonderful discussion on the Kohli's, the original inhabitants of Bombay, uh, right here in this venue, so do come. Uh, but thank you to Bharti Mehra. Is she here by any chance? Uh, she's the one who introduced us to Gunita and made all this happen. I know she's stuck in traffic somewhere. This is a Bombay story. But most of all, thank you to our audiences for being here. I mean, in such large numbers on a Monday evening, it's quite, uh, quite endearing. We will record this and share it. We know a lot of people who wanted to, uh, to be able to kunt. Um, so now we're going to come to the last part of our evening, which will be the official unveiling. We're going to request Gunita, Aparna, uh, uh, Shanaz, Mrs. Uh, Balapori, uh, Mrs. Ruya. Um, and, uh, if, um, and if any of the witnesses uh, who've contributed to uh, the archive or making of this book are there, please, I encourage you to step forward. We were told there would be a few. So if you all are there, please, please do come forward. So this is going to be first of several. Um, so do clear your shelf space um, for it. Build a new shelf if you must. Um, these are all our stories. So thank you very much for bringing this to us. Do open the book so we get a sense. Yeah. Oh, and the artworks. So, if um, if they if people sign up, um, what it, what's the story? So yeah, um, if you pre-order a book, they'll give you a twenty-five percent discount for being here, and uh, we've got some of the chapter cover art uh, made into special prints, and there are actually eight. 14 or 14 of these artworks, but we're gonna each person is going to get two random ones and they're done by the Bora sisters and each one took a very long time to make